we welcome in our next guest, honored to be joined. As I mentioned, by the voice of the UFC, a man who had a very busy weekend coaching hockey, and I'm sure he is very happy that the NHL is back, Mike Goldberg himself. Mike, how are you? I'm good, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. How happy are you that the NHL is back? And how many hours did you watch this past weekend? Uh, you know what? I watched pretty much every game I could, and I saw a game live last night with my 12-year-old son, and you know that I love coaching his team. We actually were in a tournament all weekend, oh. Ariel, and so we lost in a championship, oh. and I was, I was very encouraging. Probably doesn't surprise you to know I'm pretty vocal <laughs> on the bench. Um, so we had a blast, and Cole and I, my son, went to the Coyotes home opener last night against the Chicago Blackhawks. Hawks win, as Pat Foley would say. Hawks win, 6-4. <laughs> uh, we had a blast, though. Uh, emailed and texted a couple of my buddies in the league, and yeah, my son and I will be watching NHL tonight, uh, this evening, as we do every night and every morning. Now the hockey's back. By the way, I know 0.01% of our audience cares about this, but just curious because this stuff interests me. Like for youth hockey in Arizona, that's where you live. I mean, how big is it right. for your son and just like the, 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 the sort of system there? I mean, is, is it a big deal there? It, it really is. Oh. And, and what I've always said, because you have so many transplants, of course. I mean, I grew up in Ohio. My wife's Canadian. And you could use that example throughout the Valley. We have very good hockey. We just don't have as much as they do in Massachusetts or in Michigan or obviously in Minnesota. But what we have is very good. We had a great championship game this morning against a team from San Diego. We're a triple-A team ranked in about the 40s, and the team we played from San Diego is ranked in the top 10 in the double-A rankings. So here you have two very non-traditional hockey markets, i.e. all the problems with the Coyotes the last few years with attendance, but it was actually a very well-played hockey game. It was a lot of fun to participate in. And uh, I love the people who are interested in that because we do have a lot of hockey fans who also love the UFC and mixed martial arts. It's good. It's good. It's just not as deep as maybe where I grew up in Ohio. Uh, but our kids take it very seriously, as, as do us coaches. Well, let's move along now. Obviously, the UFC returns uh, to Fox on Saturday. It's Fox UFC Saturday, and that also means the return of Mike Goldberg on our TV screens. <laughs> and this has been a, a big story over the last six or so weeks. A lot of people wondering where you were at UFC 155, more importantly, wondering how you're feeling. Wrote the story on it, but obviously it's always good to hear from the man himself, find out how you're feeling. Take us back. Why weren't you able to call UFC 155 last month in Las Vegas? Well, as, as has been told properly, and, and thank you for taking the time to actually go to the sources uh, that knew exactly what was going on, Ariel. I ended up coming home from Brazil back in October with a, a virus, an upper respiratory infection. Ended up hospitalized a, a couple of times for it just because they were making sure that we could get my lungs open. And just the complications of trying, I'm asthmatic, I have been since high school, the complications with trying to get the proper medicines in my body so I could get rid of this virus from Brazil, by the way, not the first guy to come back from, you know, Brazil not feeling 100%. And it just kind of spiraled, you know, that, to put it simply, it was the perfect storm. And what ended up happening is my immune system was never really able to get back in balance, Ariel. And then complications came. My voice started to go, and I just wasn't, I wasn't able to get the pre-production done, and I wasn't able to voice it 100% UFC 155. Thus, I missed my first live show, uh, you know, that I did not have a schedule conflict for since I took on the job as the UFC play-by-play -play commentator back in 1997. And no one, trust me, no one was more disappointed than me. And, and you were... Despite the fact that your, your, your voice was shot and all that, you weren't feeling well, for the record, as you told me, ready and willing to take the job if need be, right? Oh, absolutely. I was, yeah, I was kicking and screaming, you know. It, as you well know, you, you do live television like you do. You know, it really doesn't matter what's going on. It's show night, so you perform. If you're at 100%, like the coaches like to say, 120%, or you're at 80 or 70% throughout my broadcast career, you know, 25 years plus. You've played hurt before. I, I've had, you know, throat infections, chest infections. I've had a head cold during the 800 games or so I called in the NHL and during the 200 UFCs or so that I've done since 1997. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a prideful guy. I consider myself, you know, a fighter as far as my broadcast spot. 
I wanted to be in my seat for UFC 155. Thus, it broke my heart. I wasn't able to do so. But, yeah, I was kicking and screaming because I wanted to call the fight. I wanted to call the rematch. I wanted to be there for a big show, just like every big show in which I want to be able to be on my headset next to my partner, Joe Rogan. And then, obviously, you know, this comes out, you know, the reports you're ill and whatnot. It's it's obviously a big story because you are that much a part of the show. But then in the days after, it snowballs into, you know, Mike Goldberg has this kind of drug issue. Mike Goldberg is here. He's there. Uh, I mean, I'm getting the hate for writing the article that I did. I, I know you are because I'm reading your Twitter and whatnot. Where did this come from? Uh, it came from one very irresponsible gossip website. No more, no less. And unfortunately, as you well know, too, Ariel, and, and all of your listeners know, this is the society that we live in today. Everybody's got a Twitter. Everybody pays their 500 bucks to get a website, and all of a sudden, they're a reliable source. And some reliable source said things that were not true about me. And what disappointed me is how many reliable sources, not yourself, you know, not, not a Kevin Ioli, not guys who actually consider themselves and act like journalists. How many renegade websites and then legit websites just went with this gossip site's source and assumed the worst instead of checking their sources, which they teach you in Journalism 101, and make sure that the story is true. And, it, you know, it, it was disappointing. Um, it was hurtful. Uh, but yet the outpour of support on Twitter by the majority of the people on social media was it was very heartfelt and it was very appreciated uh, but people like to see people like to see people fail people like gossip people like to think the worst and unfortunately that's the society that we live in when people hide behind keyboards and form opinions that aren't true do you have a drug problem Mike I absolutely do not was this damaging to your reputation, to your brand? I mean, I can't imagine it not being, but how did your, you know, the people around you, your friends, your employers, the fellow fighters, I mean, how did people react to this news, the, the, these, these, these reports, if you will? They absolutely reacted the way I hoped they would, and that is they asked to find the truth. And the truth is that I never have had a drug problem. I do not have a drug problem. I've never had any type of abuse. I, I've, never even, I've never even had any problems with, with any kind of dirt throughout my career. There, you've never seen an article written on me prior to this one that was erroneous. Um, they supported me because they wanted to find out the truth. And, and those are the people in life that you, want to, that you want to surround yourself with, Ariel. And that's what I appreciated. The people who did the due diligence to check with the real sources, not me. I, I don't expect people to believe me, but check with the doctors and, and those people who were caring for me. And the people who did that found out exactly what it was, an upper respiratory infection that spiraled into the perfect storm and ended up, you know, making me well less than 100% and unable to do UFC 155. No how, more, no less. How close to 100% are you now, other than losing your voice coaching your son this weekend? <laughs> I'm, you know, like they say in sports, I'm at 110, <laughs> minus about minus about 15 because we lost this morning. So I was a little, I was a little bummed about that. But I'm an energetic coach. I'm, I always wear the white hat. I'm the good cop on the bench. So I'm yelling the voice, board check, dump it in, dump it in. Take away this weekend of hockey, and and I feel great. I, I feel back to myself and more so the rest. Not only being a, not not so much missing UFC 155, but the fact that we were in. We were in a four shows and six week kind of swing anyway, including trips to Montreal, including trips all the way to Brazil and back. We had a busy schedule with Joe and Mai doing so many shows on top of each other. Kind of, you know, it kind of went back to where we were before when we were doing 26, 27 shows a year. I feel great. My immunity system is, is back. My immune system, pardon me, is back in check. And uh, I feel ready to go, and I'm excited to do the UFC on Fox. I love the Fox cards because they're new, they're exciting, and you have a title on the line. You got Rampage in the Octagon at the United Center in Chicago. I don't know what to do. And we will get to that in a second. One last thing on all this. Will you do anything to, you know, the one site, the many sites that reported this negative stuff about you, this, this wrong information, or are you just going to let it slide? I don't know that I'll let it slide. I'm going to let the people who represent me determine the course of action, but I feel that it is my obligation to, to 
to protect others who would be attacked erroneously. And I take that very seriously. And so it's not so much about me. It's about the statement that was made that just because you have a website, you can try to say things about people that are false and, and put them in the situation they put me in. I don't want to see that happen to somebody else. So um, trust me when I say that the people around me will determine the course of action, but I'm not just going to stand on the sidelines and let this happen to somebody. And, and just curious, do you have to take, like, are, are you 100% in the clear as far as your infection goes? Like, do you still have to be on, t- I've never had something like that, and I know you're right, asthmatic. Right. So, like, how has your life changed since then, or is it just something you have to take and now you're okay? Yeah, actually, I'm back I'm back to my normal protocol. Okay. With, you know, Simbacord inhaler and Singular, anybody who has asthma knows that's what we all take. The one thing unfortunate with asthma is, in the last 50 years, I don't really know if they've found something different, my friend. Right. It's the same inhalers. Uh, it's the same, you know, bronchial dilators. And I'm back to the exact protocol that I've had pretty much since high school, which in this case is a good thing. You mentioned UFC on Fox. It's this Saturday. You mentioned they're always special, and they still feel very special. It's only the sixth one, and you know right. I think they figured out the formula, what kind of card to put on Fox. From a broadcasting perspective, I'm always interested in this kind of thing, and my job's different than yours. Um, is it different as far as you know pre-production, as far as the meetings, as far as you know what's going on in your headset? Is it different when it's a Fox show, or is it the same kind of show as if you're calling UFC 152? For me, it's different in the pre-production modes because, as you know, it's a different format. But once the headset goes on, other than, you know, kind of coming on camera before every fight with a throw from Kurt and Randy and Brian, Joe and my job is the same on Fox, and that is to call the fights. And really with the format, yourself included, that we have on Fox, Ariel, The shows are less cumbersome because we have the support of the desk and the studio, and we have other guys breaking it down and analyzing, as opposed to a pay-per-view, where once we're on pay-per-view, Joe and I pretty much have the ball and we run with it for the better part of, you know, three to four hours, uh, depending on how long the fights are going in our broadcast window. So it is the same job, but format-wise, the way I do my sponsorship elements, the way I do my cards and my leads, They are different just because the format is different. But at the end of the day, Joe and I take two guys walking through the gate, and we talk about what happens in the octagon. So that is very much the same as it's been since Ultimate Japan. Are you the kind of guy who, when he's watching another MMA fight, a boxing match on HBO or Showtime, a hockey game on any kind of channel, NBA, NFL, etc., are you studying, are you dissecting, are you thinking about the announcers more so than the actual action? I have always, always watched TV like that. Even before I started to be able to do play-by-play, uh, once I was interested in this business, I never watched TV the same again. Absolutely 100%. That's the way I look at it. I know more who the announcers are on the game than sometimes the quarterback. I, I really do. Wow. And you know, I'm the guy who looks at the USA Today and we see the matchups, and I want to know not so much who's playing, who's not playing, who might be injured. I want to know who's announcing the game. And so absolutely 100%. I'm always listening to the announcers. I'm always seeing how the format is. Um, I'm checking out how they handle replays, how they interact with each other. I watch the game as a broadcaster uh, 100% of the time, which is fun for me because that truly is my passion. So if it's, if it's Mike Emmerich and Eddie Olchek or if it's Dave Strader and Darren Pang, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm watching an NHL game. If it's the NFL on Fox, am I watching Joe Buck and Troy Aikman? Am I watching Moose and Kenny Albert? That, it's not so much if it's going to be the Cardinals and the Seahawks. It's, is it Dick Stockton today? Uh, what game is Dick doing? What sport is he doing? It is it Tommy Brenneman, the son of my hero Marty Brenneman, the longtime voice of the Cincinnati Reds? At this point, you're you're closing in on on 50, right? So you've been doing this a long time, um, and I'm wondering, do you still feel like you take things away from these guys? Like I feel like I do it now all the time. I mean, oh, he does it this way, he speaks this way, he does this this uh-huh. way. Do you still do that, or at this point, you feel like you are who you are, you have your style, and you haven't changed for a while? No, absolutely not. I, I absolutely agree with what you said first. You, you can get better every day, and the old saying in life is the minute you stop moving forward, you start moving backwards. So trust me when I tell you that 
every time I watch any type of broadcast, I try to learn something. And, and I remember when I was younger, Bob Costas was a guy I really looked up to, and also Gary Thorne, because I try to emulate kind of that excitement, to try to have that big voice and, and make people that aren't paying attention on the other side of the room hear that, hear that excitement in my voice and go, well, I need to run to the TV right now. Something big is happening. That's the way I broadcast the UFC. That's the way I called hockey games. Every other play-by-play I did, including, you know, if it's Arizona Cardinals preseason football, if it's NFL Europe, whatever it is, those are the men I emulate, and I continue to do that every day. And as you see younger broadcasters come in, yeah, you can learn from these kids because they're doing things differently, and you have to continue to evolve every day in life. And that is absolutely the way I approach it. It's not one of those, oh, I got it, I'm really good, I've done this much. When you start standing still, other people pass you. What do you think of John Anik? He's outstanding. He's educated. He's, uh, he's classy. He's, he's very polite. He's very respectful of me. And he's done his homework. He continues to do his homework. And what I like most about John Anik is that he gets better every show. And he is an example of what you just said. You can tell that he's a student of the game. And not just the MMA game. He's a student of the broadcast game. And because of that, you see John improve and get more comfortable every time he puts on the headset. I'm, I'm a big fan of John Annex because John Annex reminds me of myself. You just pointed out I'm almost 50. I guess it was a couple of decades ago. But John <laughs> reminds me of myself. And, and I hope that John would take that as a compliment. You know, one of the big sort of talking points in MMA these days is how guys are talking to get title shots. You know, we saw what happened with Chael Sonnen and John Jones, Vitor Belfort trying to push Chael Sonnen out of the way this weekend in a post-fight interview with John Anik. Where does a, a longtime broadcaster of this sport, a guy who has seen this sport evolve a couple times uh, since you started way back when, where do you fall in this discussion? I mean, are you okay with guys going out there and trying to play matchmaker, or would you rather see less of that? I love it. I love it. And you know what it goes back to? It goes back to George St. Pierre on his knees. Yeah. I want the title shot. Please, <laughs> please. The Dana, I want the shot. I want to fight for the belt. It goes all the way back to George. You know what it tells me? These guys want to be in the biggest spotlight. They want to fight the best in the world, and they want to do it as soon as possible. I absolutely love it. I mean, Chael Sonnen has positioned himself to be in big fights and have the potential of his dream coming true, a dream that he promised his father, you know, when he was a wrestler, that he promised his father, who no longer is with us, that he will be a world champion. I got news for you. Guys who want to fight the best in the world and be in the big fights, I love those kind of people because they're not hiding, they're not hiding on the sidelines waiting for somebody else to do it for them. We know the big guys. We know the big names. It's obvious that you love calling fights like John Jones and Rashad Evans, things like that. Is there a name who may be climbing the ranks, a younger guy who you're like, this is a guy that you know I feel privileged to be able to call his fights and sort of see him climb the ladder, so to speak, and I want to be there when he's fighting for the title. Is there a guy or two that you really look at as far as the new generation is concerned that really gets you excited when you see the, the bouts and you're like, wow, he's on the card tonight? Uh, Rory McDonald. Absolutely. I had a feeling. I had a they feeling won. you would say that. Yep, absolutely. And, and keep in mind that my wife is from British Columbia. Right, right. She grew up a couple hours away from Kelowna, where where Rory was born and raised. My wife's from Christina Lake, British Columbia. And you had the story of this 19-year-old kid, kind of being the first guy to train in all facets of mixed martial arts since day one. Those are the kind of guys that I root for. And when I see him have great fights with Carlos Condit, be seconds away from actually remaining unbeaten in the octagon and defeating Carlos. And now the rematch is forthcoming. Those are the kind of stories that I enjoy to watch. And it's the new breed of kids, and they are kids, by the way, that, that come into this sport as mixed martial artists since day one. Mike Ricci, you know, his good friend, is another example of that. Colton Smith, hmm. you know, a wrestler at heart. But since we've really got down to... You know, to the nitty-gritty, he's been training in all the facets of mixed martial arts. Michael McDonald, some of these young guns, I absolutely enjoy watching them progress. And a kid who I really love to watch fight, who just had a big win, you know, a couple of nights ago, is Edson Barbosa. Hmm. And if you ask me what was the greatest knockout that I've had the privilege of calling, you know, it was the wheel kick, Edson Barbosa, Terrier. That was sick. 
and I remember it vividly every time I think about it. I can see Terry going down. Uh, the, kid, the kid's got world champion written all over him. He's just in there with a lot of people who have world champion written all over them as well. But how, Rory McDonald would be the example of what you spoke of. How hard is it to call a flyweight fight? You know, you got one in the main event this weekend. How do you, how do you <laughs> call that action? <laughs> how do you do it? Uh, you know what? You got to slow down because they're going fast. <laughs> you, can't, you can't try to call every punch because you, you, your voice will be gone, you know, early in the round. It's a different tempo, that's for sure. It's a different tempo. But it's, it is in that regard, but it also makes me think about the first time Frankie Edgar was in there against B.J. Patton. All of a sudden, Frankie's footwork was so superior, his speed and his athleticism, that B.J., this, this legend of the octagon, and he is one, and a future Hall of Famer, he couldn't find Frankie. So it's the same as when Frankie and others like him kind of burst on the scene. I think Frankie, you know, not to have people have a chance to make fun again, but Frankie was a bit of a changing of the guard uh, when he first came on the scene. <laughs> was able to, to defeat B.J. Penn and shock the world and then go and do it again. Uh, the flyweights are just an example of everything. They're the speed, the athleticism, um, their technical fighting is, is oftentimes much more brilliant than the guys who depend on their strength and their pure size as you will see different matchups as you get to the heavier weights. Yeah, I, I equate it to the guys who have to be perfect in everything. Their precision needs to be precise because <laughs> uh, they're, they're dealing with clones of themselves. Two last quick things before we let you go, and you actually just alluded to, to one of my last questions, and we appreciate the time very much. You know, the criticism, the, the changing of the card, the precision, precision <laughs> needs to be precise, all that stuff that you get. Um, it seems like, and I'm learning this, I mean, you're able to laugh about it, clearly. On Twitter, I see the way you handle it. Was that something that you had to teach yourself, or were you always like that? No, I had to teach myself, trust me. I definitely <laughs> had to teach myself, and I still have to because... It goes back to what we were talking about before, is that some people do it in a fun way, and I poke fun at myself. If I didn't love and respect B.J. Penn so much, I could have said that Roy McDonald did turn the prodigy into a prodigy. I, I, I could have said that. <laughs> but I laughed when I said it, because I'm a human being. And that's what all of this has made me chuckle and sit back at all these things that were written and said. I'm a human being who loves what I do, and it's amazing. I had a sick day, and the world wants to think that, you know, oh, my gosh, Goldie's in huge trouble. Um, yeah, I'm able to laugh at myself because it's fun. It's funny. I see some of these videos, and I go, that was well done. That was well played. It, it makes me chuckle. So, yeah, I'm able to laugh at it because I've done this a long time. And there's an old saying in life to consider the source, right? Right. Final thing, and we look ahead to Saturday night. Will Saturday night be the last fight in the UFC for Rampage Jackson? I believe it will be. Hmm. Uh, I, I really do, and, and, and that bums me out. That bums me out. And, of course, that's a bigger Dana Lorenzo Rampage and his management issue. Yeah. Um, I have this gut it might be. Uh, that said, if Rampage comes in and he's able to you know, throw up, throw up a highlight reel knockout finish of really a dude who has champion written all over him, and Glover Tashira, does Rampage get hungry again and want another chance at John Jones or Chael Sonnen or whoever changes the guard by the time he would be back in, you know, the top contender spot? He might get hungry for that belt again. He might, he might have the chain eye on, I want my belt back. <laughs> um, and I would love that because there are many guys that I love to watch fight, but there's a handful that I just know something brilliant is going to happen or has the potential of happening when they walk in the octagon. And Quentin Rampage Jackson is definitely one of those guys. Mike, not only am I happy that you're returning to the broadcast booth, as I call it, cage side on Saturday, more importantly, happy to hear you're okay, happy to hear you're feeling better, happy to hear those, uh, those respiratory issues are behind you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for the time, and we will see you in Chicago. Good luck on Saturday calling that action. I will see you in Chicago, and, and thank you for having the integrity of being a true journalist in this day and age. It does not go unnoticed, not just by me, but by, you know, the hundreds of thousands of fans you have. You should be very proud of yourself as well. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you, Mike. Hey, bud. There he is, Mike Goldberg, the voice of the UFC, returning to action, returning to call the action, I should say, on Saturday, Fox UFC Saturday. That's what they're calling it. Chicago, Illinois, United Center, John Dotson versus Demetrius Johnson for the flyweight title, Rampage Jackson versus Glover Teixeira. 
Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus Anthony Pettis and Eric Koch versus Ricardo Lamas. That's the main card. The undercard kicks off at 5 p.m. Eastern on FX. There's a Facebook fight as well. Josh Janicek just reported by the UFC out. Now Michael Kuyper has, uh, I think, lost three opponents, so he's not fighting on the card. There are 11 cards, 11 fights, excuse me, on the card on Saturday, uh, January 26th.